Hello, this is Professor Steve Potter. Here I will show you the steps for carving a 3D terrain map out of wood with a CNC machine. I also have written a detailed Instructable tutorial at Instructables.com. I'll put a link below. These are the San Gabriel Mountains, the backdrop of where I grew up in Altadena and Pasadena around here near Los Angeles, California. I've hiked and biked and camped all over these mountains with my father, whose name is Philip D. Potter. I decided to give him a carving for his 85th birthday. Terrain carvings are made from a geotiff or a digital elevation map where satellite data is coded, the altitude is coded, in 16-bit grayscale. Dad worked for the Jet Propulsion Lab and helped develop the side-looking radar that satellites use to create these elevation maps. These data are freely available at the USGS website. But that was in 2017. I will show you how to use a web-based tool called Touch Terrain that makes collecting DEMs and creating a 3D model easy. I use my trusty HandyBot portable CNC carver to make that map of the San Gabriel Mountains. The HandyBot has a 6 inch by 8 inch work area, so to make this I had to move it along the workpiece eight times. And you can see some of the imperfections caused by the joins between the different tiles there. I marked significant places with rhinestones. There's Caltech where Dad went to school and JPL where he worked and some places that we hiked and camped. I love the way this plywood looks in these carvings where the plies look a lot like contour lines on a topo map. But watch out for voids that you might see in the wood. If you use this inexpensive plywood here, you might have voids or you might have overlapping plies. And in fact, if there are these voids, the peaks might even break off. I wanted to carve larger works of art without tiling, so I built my own CNC machine. This is the mostly printed CNC machine. I printed the plastic parts on my 3D printer. It's the Primo version by V1 Engineering. I would say it has the best performance per dollar of any CNC machine because it's very hackable, you can make it any size you want, and it's quite powerful. I made mine portable, so I have the control electronics in this toolbox here, and this is a portable cooling unit for the spindle. I fixed up the electronics to make this machine faster and more powerful than the first version and I made a whole another YouTube video about that which will be linked below. To make my CNC machine portable I also added swivel wheels here so that I can load it in and out of my car and take it all across Ireland where I teach maker workshops. So that's the kit that I'm using but just about any CNC machine with a router or spindle can make terrain carvings. Start your CNC project with some good quality wood like this Baltic birch plywood. This is 18 millimeters thick. This grade B plywood costs about 180 euros for a 4 by 8 foot sheet here in 2022. Look at the edges carefully and make sure that there are no holes. Also you probably don't want to buy the top sheet because it might have different humidity on the top versus the bottom of it and when you bring it home it'll get warped. Once again Look carefully at the edges for voids, knots, overlapping plies. It's fine for practicing with this cheap plywood, but it's not very good for making a nice work of art. So ideally find the A-grade plywood if you can find it. It's hard to find and very expensive, but it's really good stuff. So this is my more recent carving using this birch plywood. And in this case, I also did a resin pour for the Irish Sea. These are the Morn Mountains here, and this is the Cooley Peninsula. This is the town of Dundalk, northeast of Ireland. I've hiked all over these hills and mountains, and so they mean a lot to me. This is a carving I made for my brother, who recently moved to the state of Idaho. It also includes a fold-out map of the state. This is where my sister lives in Orange County, California. After cutting the wood to size, I glue two sheets of this plywood together using wood glue. I prefer this Gorilla Wood Glue, which dries pretty clear. 
You could also use Tight Bond 3 Ultimate wood glue, which is very strong and also waterproof, although we probably won't be putting our artwork out in the weather. Lots of detail is possible in these CNC terrain carvings if two things. One, you get good satellite data like this and you use a fine finishing bit. I'll talk more about those in a minute. These small hills are the drumlins in County Monaghan in Ireland where we live. They are only about 100 feet tall. Each one has its own local folklore and names. So now I'll show you how to create a 3D model using the Touch Terrain interface. Touch Terrain was created by Chris Harding at Iowa State University and Franek Hasiuk at University of Kansas. They created this wonderful open source and free interactive tool to take satellite digital elevation models and turn them into 3D models so that their students could print them and bring them on geology field trips. Okay, go to touchterrain.geol.iastate.edu. Probably the first thing you'll want to do is to type in an area of interest to you. So let's do Big Bear Lake. Okay. Now, probably you'll see terrain appear if you're in the continental United States. This first one is chosen. If you're not in the United States, then you need to choose one of these other ones. If you just see this map of the roads and stuff, this slider can switch between showing terrain and showing the Google Maps underneath, or both of them faded out. This one has very good resolution, 10 meters per pixel. This one is a worldwide map made by JAXA, the Japanese Space Administration, with 30 meters per pixel resolution, which is also very good. And you might want to explore these other ones as well. So the way that this looks on the screen here uh, doesn't affect the way your model comes out. It's just uh, for helping you decide what area to select. So for instance, I may wish to zoom out a bit here and grab these red corners and stretch them to cover a bigger area. If you don't see the red box, you must click this recenter box on map. It's somewhere else in the world and it will come over to the middle of your map now. Once you've selected the area that you like, zoom back in on it and open this window that shows you the longitude and latitude of the area that you've selected. You have the option of using a polygon that you've created in something like Google Earth from a KML file. That's helpful if you, for example, wanted to carve something like a state or a country or an island, that something that's not rectangular. The next thing to do is go down to 3D printer options. And in fact, we're doing CNC options here. So we'll follow the advice in this little pop-up window, which says choose one of these CNC options here. I'll choose the large size one. And then for nozzle diameter, you should probably choose high detail, which is approximately the same as 0.2 millimeter nozzle. And have a look at this box here called effective DEM resolution. It will tell you whether or not you're getting close to what the best possible resolution is from the data set, which in this case is 10 meters per pixel. This effective DEM resolution is influenced by the size and the nozzle diameter that you've chosen. You'll notice that the maximum size you can choose is around 110 millimeters, which is not very big. Remember this was made for 3D printers. If you're cutting a work of art that will be bigger than 110 millimeters across, you're going to be scaling this and this number may or may not be relevant to you. It will get scaled as well. I would choose the thickest model base thickness unless for some reason you want a very thin base on your model. And for vertical exaggeration that depends very much on how big of an area that you have in your chosen area there. So if it's a big area like a country or a continent, you will want to use a very big multiplier because the mountains are relatively small by comparison. If it's a small area like an individual property, you might even want to reduce it. 
So you have many options and there are a couple of steps later on where you can change this if you don't quite get it right. I usually choose times three. That's good for about a hundred kilometer wide uh, region there. You want to export it as an STL binary and in this box called manual settings you have a number of options. The one that I like to use is called lower lack which drops the areas below sea level down a few millimeters, however many millimeters you specify. If you want to learn more about other manual options, you can go to the GitHub page, which is linked down at the bottom of this page, and uh, scroll down here, and you can see a list of all the manual options, including the one that I just mentioned, Lower Lek. And then below that is an explanation of how to use each of those options. Okay, so once you think you have all this set up, before you hit Export Selected Area and Download File, it's a really good idea to do some screen captures with a couple of different settings of this transparency. One that has all the Google Maps stuff here. By the way, you can also choose Satellite if you prefer that for your Google Maps. And then you should do a screen capture with just the terrain and you should do one with just with uh, some sort of a blend of the two and you can adjust these parameters here to determine how the hill shading looks in this part here. So if you do these screen captures you might get to use them later on to create a fold-out map to go with your CNC carving. Okay now we're going to hit export selected area and download file and if you're lucky, you'll see this locomotive chugging away here to say that their computer is processing all of the data from wherever the data source came from and turning it into a 3D model for you. If you're unlucky, a me message will pop up that says data is too large or image is too large and you'll have to go back and change some of the parameters to reduce the number of pixels that you have and hopefully get it underneath their uh, threshold, which I think is around 700,000 pixels. So that was very quick. You have an option to preview the STL in a browser, but I don't think it's worth doing that because it just takes just about as long to download it, and then it'll be quicker and easier to preview it on your own computer. However, before you leave here, you should do two things. One is type in what you're gonna do with this. So I always type in CNC carving because that way they'll know who's using this and for what and they'll make the user interface more tailored towards people who are using the CNC machine instead of a 3D printer. The other thing you might want to do is to copy this text here which is a URL that you can click on later on to get you right back to this page here that has all the parameters you've chosen. So all the exact same parameters are in this URL here. And if you want to recreate the carving but with just changing a few of the parameters, it's very handy for that. Okay, so the next thing is to download the zip file. Might take a while depending on your internet speed. Okay, once you unpack the zip file the touch train sends you, you will see three files. One is the GeoTIFF, which is the grayscale coded image. One is a log file, which is a text file that has information about what you uh, what you chose in the interface and that's a good place to paste that URL that you copied from the web page here. Okay, then you'll always have it in case you need to go back and uh, redo things. But the thing we're really interested in here is a 3D model or STL file. Once you have created your 3D model with touch terrain, you want to check it and possibly scale it in some program that can look at STL files such as Prusa Slicer. Okay, so we opened the STL file in Prusa Slicer. Here you can have a good look at it and decide whether it has all the details that you want in your carving. And if not, you can go back and create a new model in touch terrain. You also want to have a look at the steepness of the mountains and whether the vertical scale is too exaggerated or too flat, one or the other, whether your CNC machine will want to carve that. The next thing I'm going to do is scale it to the size of 
the wood that I've cut. So the width of the wood or the X dimension is about 550 millimeters. So I'm going to type 550 millimeters and it scales that up. So now it's more the aspect ratio of the wood that I have. Now you can see that it looks way too tall. In fact, it's 148 millimeters. So to scale the Z, I have to unclick this little lock here and then type in how thick I want it to be. So let's type 36 millimeters. Okay, that's more like it. So this is much more like the real terrain and much more like what it's going to look like when it's carved. If you're happy with that, then you want to save it, export it from Prusa Slicer, export plate as STL, and I'm going to note that this one is scaled. Okay, and we're done with that part. Once you have your STL file scaled and it looks good even when you zoom in on it, the next thing is to import it into your favorite CAM or CAD package. Could be uh, Fusion 360. I prefer VCAR Pro and I'll show you how to do that now. All right, you've scaled your model in Prusa Slicer. Next thing to do is to set up a job in VCAR Pro. So you should select create a new file and then you get to this job setup window here where you specify the size of the wood that you have. In my case it's 600 by 300 millimeters and about 36 millimeters thick. You should actually measure the wood because it might not be what you think it is. So be before you uh, do this job setup part, go back and measure your wood after you've glued it together. Then you want to set the Z0 position and the XY datum where you would like them. I always set the Z0 at the material surface. If you are going to carve the top of the stock away as you're carving your terrain and there won't be any more material left to zero against, you're going to need another object that's the right height to zero with. So keep that in mind. I talk about this in my instructables. And then the, my datum is in the lower left hand corner. Your machine may differ. The modeling resolution doesn't matter. For material setting, it's a good idea to um, choose something that is not birch because it has grain on it that might cover up some of the features that you're trying to look at. So I just choose these homogeneous ones, uh, plastic ones. Then hit OK. All right, you've got your job all set up in VCAR Pro. Next thing is to go to the modeling tab here and import the scaled STL that you scaled in Prusa Slicer. If it's pointing in the wrong direction, you can rotate it with these buttons here. The next thing to do is to center it into the workpiece. And it looks like I didn't scale the Y dimension uh, to be small enough. So my work area in, on my machine is 300 millimeters and I see that this is 311. So I'm going to scale this now to 300 and that will shrink the other dimensions too a little bit. Now it will fit in, fit within the workpiece. This is also another chance to scale the vertical dimension if you need to. So the only thing you have to do now is click position and import. Now in here there is a plane here called the modeling plane which is useful for determining where you're going to add extra features like maybe if you're going to carve some text or some other designs onto the terrain then you can use that modeling plane as a reference plane. I usually set it at the top. Uh, we can set it at the bottom in this case just to get it out of the way so we don't have to look at it. And then we click import. Okay, so here you have 3D rendering. Looks very good. So we'll go back to the drawing tab now and back to the 2D view. The next step is to draw a box around the model and you could use the rectangle tool Another way to do it is to select the model and to use this icon here which traces a bitmap around it. So choose black and white and then 
slide this threshold all the way over so that it selects everything in there. And for the corner fit, you may want to choose a loose fit in case the edges are a bit pixelated and jagged. It might smooth them out a bit. And then you say preview. That looks like a good outline to me. Hit apply and close. All that did was give you a line that you can select around the model here. Once you have your 3D model imported into VCAR Pro, the next thing is to create tool paths. All right, so with trace bitmap, you've created and selected this outline of your model. Next thing you want to do is create a pocket that goes around the model that you're going to use to cut it out. And the easiest way to do that is with the offset tool here in drawing. So we're going to go out about one and a half times the width of your cutout bit. So if the bit is a quarter inch, it's about six millimeters, we'll say eight or nine millimeters outwards. So that will be that and this will be the two lines that define a pocket that we'll use to cut it out. And we go to tool paths, select both of those vectors and go to the pocket toolpath, not the profile toolpath. And you decide on depth, we'll say 36, assuming that the wood is about 37 millimeters thick. And for this, you can have the step over be almost the entire width of the bit. Past depth should be conservative. Tenth of an inch is a good conservative number. Feed rate is probably too fast here, so I would turn that down. And here you have a choice between offset and raster again. You definitely want offset, which will go around in circles. Raster will go back and forth in the, in the groove there. And you definitely want to select climb cut, not conventional, because conventional tends to grab and drive the bit into the work there. Especially if you're using a down cut bit, you want to ramp the plunge move to get the chips some pathway to get out. And there's a tool path. All right, the next step is the roughing tool path. That's this little pyramid of circles here. Rough machining. So I use a six millimeter end mill. You want to use a sturdy carbide bit. Uh, I use upcut, three flute. Um, you step over could be most of the width of the bit. 80% is what I use. Maximum speed of my spindle is 24,000. And you can push it very as fast as your machine can go without breaking the bit uh, because this is just a roughing pass. You don't have to worry about details and tear out and things like that. The machining allowance is how much wood will be left behind after the roughing pass that needs to be cut away by the finishing pass. So two millimeters is a good number. You can choose different strategies here. I think that the 3D raster one is a little bit safer. The Z-level strategy will carve around the peaks and sometimes they might break off if you're going that fast. Also there's a lot more plunging and lifting going on in the Z-level strategy than the 3D raster strategy. You can save a little bit of time by clicking avoid machine areas, but again, there's more plunging and lifting. You don't need to worry about ramping the plunge moves in this case, assuming your bit can do plunges. And that's about it. Okay. Next step is finishing pass. So that's this dome shaped icon. I use a tapered ball nose bit. That is 1.5 millimeters in diameter. Six millimeter shank. And it's a two flute upcut. So step over is important. If you do anything more than 10%, you're likely to see raster lines, which you know you might like those, but or you might have to sand them off, which is a lot of work. So it's better to go with a very fine step over for a minimum amount of sanding. This one you can move very quickly because it doesn't have to take off very much wood if with a 10% step over. 
So you want to select the vector that surrounds your model there. And you have a choice of offset and raster strategies. The offset strategy will start in the middle and circle around in polygons until it gets to the outside edge. And the raster one will go back and forth, or if you've selected some other than zero degree raster angle, 35 degree would go about like this. They take about the same amount of time. One nice advantage of the offset is you can specify only climb cuts, whereas the raster one will do climb and conventional as it goes back and forth. Climb cuts are less likely to cause big strings of wood to get caught up on the bit, and they, I think they're more efficient. So I, I recommend the offset strategy and climb cut. It'll take a long time to calculate this one because it's going to be about, about eight hours of cutting here. Okay, that took my laptop a few minutes to calculate because there are a lot of lines here following the terrain. If you zoom way in on them, you can see that they're very close together. And if we look at the time that it will take to do that, it'll be eight hours of cutting. So it's a marathon run, but it's well worth it to get a good finish. Once you think you have your tool paths right in VCAR Pro, it's really important that you then run a simulation to make sure that the result is what you think it will be. So here's what you should do. Have a good look at the simulated carving in VCAR Pro. Obviously you want to save your work and then go to simulation icon there, preview tool paths. So we'll reset preview here and you could simulate them one at a time so we can do the cutout. We'll do them in order that we will actually cut them. So we'll say preview visible tool path and there you go, and you can see that I've left about a millimeter at the bottom of the pocket so that when I've got screws holding the wood down, it will still be holding the middle part down well. Now we'll simulate the roughing one. Okay, that looks good. And finally, finishing tool path. Lovely. So you want to zoom in on it, have a good look at it, make sure that it has the amount of detail that you want. If you chose a step over that was too large, you will see raster lines on here. So the fact that we don't see raster lines even until we get all the way into the level of individual pixels is a very good sign. All right, so if the simulation went well, the last step is to export these toolpaths as G-code. Before you do that, actually, you may want to have a look at how much time it's going to take to do each cut. Then you might also want to create a job sheet, which is handy to print out and have uh, on hand. It will tell you which bit you're supposed to be using for each toolpath. Okay, if you did create a job setup sheet in Vectrix VCAR Pro, it looks like this. It's an HTML file and it shows you what the overall picture of the job looks like, where the, where the model lies within the stock, how it's set up, where the origin is, uh, a summary of the three different tool paths, and then a detail about each tool path saying how fast is it going and what bit are you using and that sort of thing. So it's very helpful to print that out and have it on hand while you're doing the work. And you want to then export the G code. So you select one toolpath at a time, choose your machine, make sure that you're using the right post processor for the machine that you have. So I have a Gerbil controller, and then you save the toolpath. And go ahead and do that for the other ones. So you've got your toolpaths created. 
The next step is to get your CNC machine ready to do the carving and the, before you put the workpiece down you should face the spoil board. You want to make sure that the surface of your spoil board is parallel to the rails, the X and Y rails of your CNC machine. I use two different ways to fix the workpiece to the spoil board tape and screws. The tape I use is Tiza 4298 strapping tape and I put some double stick tape on that, some very strong double stick tape made by ThermoWeb and you don't need very many pieces of that to um, stick it down quite firmly. I also drill through holes in the wood and then use long wood screws to screw it down firmly. When I'm doing the cutout tool path, I leave about a millimeter of wood there so that the wood won't come loose. The uh, screws will still be holding it down as I'm carving the other tool paths. That way I can carve the cutout tool path first and that saves wear and tear on the roughing and finishing bits because they're going to be turning around in midair rather than in wood. So here it is, screwed down in the corners. You just screw it down tight enough so that you could not slip the corner of a piece of paper anywhere underneath it. It should be well uh, adhered also with your tape. These are the cutout and roughing bits that I use, quarter inch end mills, uh, up cut or down cut. You can see on the right that I tried to go a little too fast with a cutout tool path and it started to dig into the workpiece. This was using a profile tool path. I have learned now to use a pocketing tool path instead that's a little bit wider than the bit and make it move in the climb direction, not the conventional direction. The conventional direction tends to dig in more. And also don't have the bits sticking out any more than you need to. The longer they stick out, the more they're inclined to leave the pathway that the G-code is intending them to move along. Okay, now I'll show some roughing in action. This is the conventional direction with the 80% step over. There's the climb direction and you can see that it's a lot cleaner of a cut. The roughing process produces a lot of chips and dust and you want to use a vacuum system or a shop vac or a blower perhaps to get the chips out of the path of the bit. Sometimes they can wrap around it and cause problems. Of course you also want to protect yourself from the flying wood. I use this powered ventilator face shield by Sunstrom. It's comfortable enough to wear all day long. It doesn't fog up, it fits my glasses. It also has hearing protectors clipped to it to protect my ears. Here's an example of roughing over the mountains. What you notice is that it slows down a bit as you're doing the cuts that involve a lot of vertical motion. That has to do with the limitations of the Z-axis on this machine at the time I filmed this. It's, it's a little bit better now that I put a different lead screw on. When you're finished with the roughing pass, it looks, not surprisingly, very much like the simulated version in VCAR Pro. VCAR Pro has a couple of different options for doing the roughing pass. You could do the raster, uh, which is what I prefer, on the left. Or you can do what's called the Z-level or offset strategy here. But the offset strategy produces more of these sharp right angles in the wood where forces tend to get concentrated and occasionally break peaks off. So it's a little bit safer to use the raster strategy. It does take longer though. This was estimated to take 2 hours and 11 minutes by raster and only an hour and 20 minutes by the Z-level strategy. These are the finishing bits that I use. The middle one, my favorite, is about 1.5 millimeter diameter ball end. You would probably only want to use the top very sharp one for a very small terrain carving or perhaps a carving is in metal or some, something like a medallion. Or uh, you could use a larger bit, which is about three millimeters or one eighth of an inch for something where it's big enough that you don't mind that it might have a scalloped surface. Here I'm comparing a step over setting of 20% versus 15%. And if we zoom in on that, you can see that the 20% shows some rastering lines and the 15% doesn't. In fact, 
I actually use 10% most of the time because even the 15% step over still shows some raster lines. A 10% step over, that's about 150 microns per line if you're using a bit that's one and a half millimeters across on its tip. So that's six thousandths of an inch per step over. Now I'll show some examples of the finishing toolpath in action. While you're carving, you may want to use an IR thermal camera to check the temperature of the bit, make sure that it's not getting too hot. If it were to snap, that could cause a fire hazard if it falls into uh, wood chips, and it also wears the sharp edges down quicker if it overheats and, and softens the metal. It's fun to watch during the finishing process how the details get revealed as the wood left behind by the roughing pass gets carved away. You can see about three millimeters of wood here. Uh, left behind by the roughing pass. Here's a case where I was trying to push the process finishing too fast and I lost Z steps in the stepper motor that controls the Z axis. In that case, as when it digs into the wood like this, uh, you probably have wasted this piece of wood. I have fixed this problem by using a different lead screw that allows the Z axis to move faster and keep up with the X and Y axes at about 50 millimeters per second, which is fast enough for me. Here is a dramatic reenactment of cutting the edges, the waste wood off the uh, piece after finishing the finishing pass. With a curved shape like this, it's very handy to have a bandsaw. You can also use a coping saw or a jigsaw if you have them. If you have a piece that just has straight edges, of course, you could just use a table saw to cut those edges off and then sand them with a belt sander to make sure that any marks left behind by the cutter are smoothed out. Even with a very small step over there will be some fibers that need to be sanded off. Ideally what you want is something like this that's fairly smooth. So I spent a lot of time with the Dremel and an abrasive sponge wheel sanding these. It usually takes five or six of these sponge wheels to, uh, to get a piece so that it's completely smooth all over. These ones that are disc shaped are good for getting into small valleys and crevices in your terrain. After sanding, then you want to coat it with uh, some spray lacquer. This spray lacquer from Lidl is very good. I prefer gloss. It usually takes three to seven coats of lacquer with uh, light sanding and you don't want to spray a very thick coat, only a thin coat for each coating. Sand it in between coats. Gloss lacquer gives a nice effect called chatoyancy, which is how the luster of the layers of plywood change with the lighting direction. Here's an example of that. With clear glossy varnish, the chatoyancy of the grain really shows up nicely. The light's coming from different directions. So after you've done your sanding and finishing, some possible extras that you might want to consider are to make a resin pour, to create a frame for your artwork, to brand it, or perhaps to make a fold out map to put behind it. So resin pouring is tricky and there's lots of other good YouTube tutorials about that, so I won't go into detail, but just to say a couple of important things. One is make sure that the workpiece is completely level before you pour it. And I used, in this case, a masking tape dam to uh, keep the resin from pouring over the edges. 
And that has resulted in a meniscus along the edge here of about a few millimeters that I had to sand off. And it's very hard to sand that off without accidentally scratching the uh, top of the ocean there. So a much better tape to use than masking tape is this Tisa tape, the very same tape that I used for holding the workpiece down, 4298 strapping tape. And you want to fold it over on itself, so this is a folded edge here. The resin doesn't tend to climb up on this tape the way it does on masking tape, so there's very little meniscus. The resin I used is by Ink Lab, and it's great because it has no odor. It takes about, it has about a 40 minute working time, or in my cold garage, maybe three hours. Uh, if, you, if you want it to set faster, you can preheat it or work in a warm space. I colored the ocean with these uh, pigment and sparkles, mica powder. It produces these wonderful effects that evoke the idea of ocean waves and currents. To decide how much resin to mix up, I used a, a large piece of cardstock. I embossed it along the coast edge there and then cut it out and weighed it and compared that weight to the weight of the whole sheet to calculate what its area is and multiply that by the depth of the ocean to get the volume. Sometimes knots and grain, hardwood grain, show up as interesting features that evoke sunken ships or ocean currents. So you might want to make the resin transparent enough that some of these show through. Here it is just after pouring while it's still liquid and you can see that the mica has an interesting texture to it. You can change that by moving it around with a stick or something. After it has settled for three hours in my cold garage, it's much less chaotic. If you wanted it to include those chaotic features, you might heat it up to make it set a little bit faster. You might want to make a frame for your CNC carving. I use some mahogany molding cut on a fine tooth miter saw and then glued together with this miter fast CA glue and accelerator. Then I sanded it with a random orbit sander, uh, 200 grit or finer. I made a box frame to go underneath the frame, subframe. It's fastened together in the corners with screws so that you can loosen them and then adjust the height of the model within the subframe to set the height of the carving behind the frame. Then I glued the subframe to the frame using a small amount of polyurethane gr Gorilla Glue which expands to fill the gaps. You might favor a simple flat frame or perhaps something made from more fancy molding like this. You might also want to create a brand here. I'm designing a brand in VCar Pro, which I carved on my HandyBot out of a very thick brass hinge. I heat it with a butane torch and then I can brand the back of my artwork there. Another extra is to make a fold-out map. Here I'm collecting screen captures from Google Maps with the terrain setting turned on. And the contour lines on the terrain only show up at certain zoom levels. So I had to compile 25 tiles together and I merged those with a graphics program called GIMP. I then printed it on some quality paper and laminated it and created a tape hinge. That way it can be folded out if somebody wants to know where a certain landmark is or where, where they're looking they can have a look at the map and compare that to the carving. If you're going to hang it on the wall, you want to make sure that you use some sturdy hardware, some strong picture wire and a well-anchored hook. Ideally, attach your hook to a stud behind the wall. So if you want more details, please comment below or go have a look at my Instructable on instructables.com. And of course, as always, like and subscribe if you want to see more YouTube videos from me. Thank you.